Hey, Perry. Hello. Hi, how are you? I just how got you. Gong Ma, Gong Ma? I just saw your, your email to Dan. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, I just follow up, you know, what you told me earlier. You know, so. Am I right? Do I remember right that you said you were... Um... Uh, you you were a student of Blake LeBlaren. You were yes, that's right. Yeah, so actually, it's a long time ago. You know, like uh, I just another day. I just just it's like two decades ago almost. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. I I um I, he probably I, I actually tried uh for a little while a whole summer yeah. taking his yes. um Santa yep. Fe model and yes, adding yes. in a credit market and it was a complete yeah. failure. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. That's great because that that's exactly the same. You know, I, you know, yeah. at the last time you told me, because you know when you were at the last year, like the, you, you know, there was a Bloomberg event you went to, you know, I was there too, uh, so you know we talked after the event. Oh, did we? This was the debate that, with know, Sultan. Yes, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay, so what happened is like you told me like you know so somehow you put in you know the carried you know model right into into blake's uh, you know that's uh, you know somehow it's blow up blow up or something but i think you're i should be you know maybe you know i mean that's my effort my second effort to do it i think it's hard to somehow you know to make that works you know so i mean just maybe it's a different model you know i'm not i think it might very i think it's no 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 i think it should be should work beautifully because you're you know his model is a little bit too simplistic, I guess, right? Because you put more, you know, institutional, you know, uh, structure, yeah. detail, you know, that I, kind of thing. I, I think I, I, just I remember that. that you, what I, when I did that, it was really before mm. I had the dealer model in mind. And in some mm. ways, the fact that that model blew up made me appreciate what the outside <laughs> spread is doing. The outside spread <laughs> okay. is is yeah. creating bounds, and so okay. I, I that that if I was to do it again, I would I would bring that feature of the trainer yeah. model into in, in, in more centrally. It wasn't in there at all. Um, you know, right. remember Blake had yes, that's prices. Right. Prices were moving mm -hmm. all the time to clear mm -hmm. markets, but mm -hmm. in the dealer model, they don't have to move to clear markets because the dealer's right, absorbing right. excess excess. So. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yes, good luck. Right, good luck. Right. I think it's. I'm glad that no, no, somebody no, is taking keep, up. Keep in touch, you know. So I just okay. let you know, you know, good. before I you know make any progress on it. But I think your idea is uh, extremely valuable. It's like, uh, you know, put the money as uh, infrastructure, right? You know, that's I, you know, because I, I think that's a very, you know, now you you sort of like came out to you know, uh, to do more. I think, but I think you know, think about you know. Uh, you know the Robert Lucas, right? You know he's uh, he's uh, you know Nobel Prize lecturer. You know the the speech is based on the money neutrality, right? So you yes. are sort of like saying you know so that you know that has a, so such a big influence, you know, to the to the yes. economists, right? You know, but but what you are saying, you know, so but for a long time, you know, we we couldn't, you know, we can you know Robert Lucas, he's a smart man, right? You know he you know he if he make a mistake, should be you know. It's not a stupid mistake, right? But some reason to do that, right? You still want to say, right? So, so you are trying. It's yes, hard to, yes, yes. yes, you know. So it's hard to articulate why he's wrong. He was wrong or something. You see what I'm saying? But I think yeah. your work is really, really uh, revealing. You know, to me, it's like you know to say that's that's why he's wrong, or you know something. I think at least it's debatable. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so. Yes. Well, I appreciate I appreciate that. Where Where are you yeah. located now, Gang? Yes, I'm New York. You're in New York. Oh, <laughs> yes, right. I was in New York last two weeks, as a matter of fact. Oh, uh, really? Okay. And now, yeah, and now okay. I'm back in Boston. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. So do you, no, are you work yeah. at a bank or something now, or? No, I'm working with the sort of like uh, you know trading firms, you know commodity trading, trading advisor, right? Yeah. Okay. But I think I was uh, yes, but I'm trying to. I want to do. Uh, you know, I want to go to the sort of a regulatory agency like SEC or CFTC, you know, to get more idea, you know, about this this thing, you know, so to understand this macro money yeah. thing, you know, so it's, yeah. So you may be interested in the, uh, since you say commodity trading, um, mm -hmm. the yes. the most recent 
advance that we've been making in the money view yes. in fact mm -hmm. is extending to commodity prices and to the price yes, level yes i, I I'm, I'm aware that i'm so excited about that yeah that, so that yeah. was my keynote lecture just a month ago um yes yes for, but for the, the problem scholars. is like you know i just you know i needed to understand this hicks better you know <laughs> the, yes. the book you mentioned right you mentioned i didn't fully understand his theory yet but i i knew he is very not very you know, great economist, you know, something. You know, well, we, another Nobel yeah. winner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Good. Right, right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Good. yes, I, I'm so very, I think, yeah, because, you know, actually it's interesting because last year, remember that when you talk about this, uh, you know, you when you have the, you know, Bloomberg talk, right? Yeah. I think you you did the best um, forecast, the word understanding, of the inflation at that, that time, right? Because during that time, people were thinking about, you know, this inflation is like, you know, 1970s, 19... Uh oh Is that... I'm just testing it to see if it works. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you yeah, see, I it? Can see it? Yeah, that's Okay, right. so that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Matthias was asking me to just test it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think we're getting we're getting moving. Um so gang, we we can we can talk offline. Um also yes, I'm coming yeah. to New York again um for a week yeah. next month. Mm -hmm. Um okay. so yeah. possibly if you want to yeah, we yeah, can yeah. we yeah, could have absolutely. a coffee or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. That'd be okay. awesome. You know, so yeah, this way. I come yeah, to New York sure. I come to New York for, for uh, pretty Quite much often. every month. But, okay. But, sure. uh, okay. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Sorry, great. Yeah, we're okay. good to talk to you again. Yes. Okay, That's great. great. Yeah. <laughs> It's good to put a face to the name. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought, can you try for a moment the PowerPoint? Please. That would be nice. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you very much. How are yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Thank you. Yes, it's working. Very good. So we got this out of the way. Perfect. Let's see where else is coming. Usually we start a bit later, tiny, teeny, tiny little bit later to give people a moment to, to come in. Mm. Okay. Um, so where, where are you, are you located now? Boston too? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. This is, this is my office. I'm at Boston university. At yeah. The... So it's, it's cold there or no? <laughs> not yeah. today actually not no today. It's... yeah today is nice so here yeah, in new york yeah, too yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right here's katarina we can't start okay. without katarina that's what okay. i was i was a bit like hmm. <laughs> hi everyone hi hi that's just... no. hi perry hi matthias hi waltraud can well, you hear me Yes. Yes, Katrina. Okay. okay. Oh wow. <laughs> Good. Start in a sec. Yeah, just give it a we have an give it another minute or so for people to come in. Catherine, are you here? Can you make sure that our presenters, if you not haven't done so already, that I'm they have working. I yeah, tried. Okay. Uh, Perfect. Okay, thank you. I'm going to shut up. I'll leave it to my tears today. Oh, no, yes. Okay. Well, great. I mean, uh, give one more minute and then we then we start. We have uh, Steffen, Steffen Muro also said he would come. I saw that he commented on one of the papers that we had to read for today. Many others. So let's see if he's not there yet. He'll come later. Yeah, and it's lunch break in, in New York, so. <laughs> right. Good. Good. Hi, Anna. Just saw you. <laughs> so many nice people here. Friends. Yeah. yeah. Christine the Sun, Julia. Wow. Oh, that's great. Matthias, shall we say something at the end or at the beginning about the next session? I'm not sure we can officially, officially, officially do it, but I think we're close enough to do it. 
What do you think? Okay, so uh, maybe we start at the beginning uh, if you want, and we also do it at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Make sure that we said it twice. So if you want to do that, and then I do the introduction of the two speakers today, if that works for you. That works yeah. for me. So I just wanted to uh, alert everyone that we have two more sessions planned for, sorry, that wasn't intended, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that we have two more sessions planned for the semester. The next one will be on uh, Monday again, 25th of March at 12.10, just like today. And we have a, a session uh, which we're still hammering out uh, because we have a policymaker who has to go through approval first at the New York Fed <laughs> to be able to join us. So I'm, I'm not going to completely announce um, um, all the details and probably not give away her name for now, but um, the, the topic will be the geopolitical economy of liquidity management. And in addition to a, a, a researcher at the Fed in New York, we will be joined by Andrea Binder, who is at the Otto Zoo Institute for Political Science in Berlin and has worked on offshore finance. And then for the final session this term um, on April 29th, we are thinking about um, and have already contacted some uh, commentators, potential um, uh, speakers here on the reconfiguration of global finance with a specific focus on China. Um, global South China seems to be particularly important. So that, that's just what's coming up. Um, we, um, we hope this will be interesting for you, but I leave it now to Matthias to, in to introduce our speakers for today and yeah. uh, take it over. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming again today. Uh, we're really happy that you can make it and then we start to have a community of people that come uh, repeatedly and so we can have a continued discussion on the political economy of liquidity. The theme today is the provision of emergency liquidity or emergency liquidity management, uh, polemically titled uh, Badgerhot versus Kindleberger, and it seeks to uh, investigate uh, the evolving liquidity management practices of central banks over the last centuries. And uh, so in order to discuss these issues, we have two really eminent experts with us that will share with us their ideas at the beginning of the seminar. Uh, and then we, as always, will get into the discussion. So 20 minutes for each and then uh, 40 minutes remaining for us to discuss. Uh, we have today with us, on the one hand, Perry Merling, who is a uh, um, very famous uh, theorist of, of money and central banks, who's today at the Party School of Global yeah. Studies at Boston University. Whom I, could you... Uh, Alia Noor, could you be so kind to... Yes. And uh, basically, who started his work uh, on uh, Fisher Black and the revolutionary idea of finance about 20 years ago, when I when I saw him for the first time, then wrote a book on the new Lombard Street, a book that really influenced a lot the interpretation of the shifting role of the Fed after the financial crisis, and has recently published a book on Kindleberger on money and empire. Uh, among others, he has also written a paper on Badger was a shadow banker, but uh, we'll, we'll hear uh, his view today on shadow banking and Badger, I'm, I'm sure of that. And um, um, the second speaker today is Waltraud Schäkle, an eminent uh, scholar, uh, herself, of course, um, who's the Joint Chair for European Public Policy at the Department for Political and Social Sciences and at the Robert Schumann Center at the European University Institute in Firenze. And she has written an outstanding study on uh, the ECB's balance sheet as a shock absorber called The Political Economy of Monetary Solidarity. She's an outstanding uh, heterodox economist, if I may, and say so. And uh, her work since then has always focused on, often focused on the study of the e European Central Bank in the face of financial instability and European solidarity. But today she will share with us her thoughts on uh, uh, Badgerhot versus Kindleberger. And we will start First with Perry, who will go for 20 minutes, and then it's going to be Waltraud's turn, after which we can then open the floor for everyone. And as always, you can put your questions into the uh, chat if you want to already put it down now because you're afraid of forgetting it, and then we'll make sure that we give you a, your turn after our two presenters uh, did their 
20 minutes each. And I will remind you of the 20 minutes. Perry, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I do have a PowerPoint, um, I, which I'm going to put up in a second. Um, I, I spent the weekend um, reviewing the all of the power all of the presentations from the, the last semester, um, and so I tweaked my PowerPoint to try to engage with some of the themes that seem to be uh, emerging there. Um, I noticed that mostly people don't have PowerPoints um, in the past, um, but uh, I'm an economist, and so I have a PowerPoint. Um, I noticed Daniela did did have a, have a have a powerpoint um the i i possibly i should have proposed different readings than i did um uh as you will see there i was responding to the prompt about kindleberger and and badget so i just gave you a paper on kindleberger and a paper on badget um but just here at the beginning and i'll repeat it at the end i want to emphasize that maybe my main point is that um emergency liquidity provision um, is really just an extreme version of what happens every day. So that I, I definitely want to, to say that my view about this is that we do not need a special theory for lender of last resort, that it evolves, that it, that it, that it, that it is implied by the correct theory for peacetime um, as, as well. And so I will try to make that to, to make that clear. Um, and that is a distinction from, I guess, mo most standard economics, which sort of does think of, well, we have, you know, ordinary theory for, and then suddenly there's these weird times and we have an exceptional theory for that time. I don't agree with that. Um, so let me, but what do I mean to say? So here I will, so I need to share screen here. Um, Okay. So far, so good. Okay. Um, so the uh, let me make that smaller and move that over there so I don't block myself. Okay. Um, so I'm taking that this is just the title from from the from the uh, uh, the announcement of the of the seminar, and I'm going to take issue with this versus part here. Um, in fact, also in the in the in the description, the it it refers to Badgett as as having an idea that lender of last resort is at a at, at a punitive rate. Uses the word punitive, um, and uh, I want to sort of take issue with that here at the beginning. Um, now, it's true that Kindleberger in, in 1978 repeatedly references Badgett's, the Badgett rule as, as, as lending freely at a penalty rate, but Badgett himself uses no such word. Um, he's, he speaks about lending at a high rate, um, and he, which he justifies as defending against an external drain and also to discourage casual use of the borrowing facility. And I think it's important to mention that, that the fact that there's lending at all is the important thing, that, that this is for times when there is no market rate. Um, so it's, it's, this is the, the, the Bank of England providing liquidity when there, when there isn't private provision of, of liquidity. Um, so it, just as a history of thought uh, question, I guess, um, somebody must have added penalty to the standard budget rule. Um, and it must have been, the, you know, certainly in 1978, Kindleberger is obviously referring to the standard way that people think about this. Um, who, who added this? When? Why? Um, uh, it's a puzzle. I don't know the answer to it. Um, but I, it, I, I think maybe it might be worth tracking down at some point. Um, Badgett does describe this high rate, um, uh, as, as Walter had mentioned to me, um, as a fine, um, uh, so that it's that there's a sort of penalty aspect to it um, in his language. Um, I, I read this, however, as he, he is really trying to anticipate the objection of people like Henke, who who were who were opposed to any lending at all. Okay, so he wants to say this is not us doing them a favor. You understand? You know, this is a this is expensive. You know, so it's a, it, he's trying to uh, justify the central bank doing this thing um, by saying we're not we're not being excessively easy on these guys. Um, at any rate, the effect of this language is maybe to create an erroneous impression of Kindleberger versus Badgett. Um, so I'm going to so I. I'm going to organize my the first part of my talk around two classic texts, Badgett's Lombard Street and Kindleberger's Manias, Panics, and Crashes, um, which my my two papers that I that I uh, put on the put on the the uh, Google Drive um, address. Um, I I argue that both of them are are misunderstood by modern readers. 
Um, but I also want to, to make the point, um, and I'm come to this at the end, that they're vital guides for present conditions, um, that these are not just of historical interest, um, that they help us think about modern situation. Um, so that's where I'm going with this. Let me begin by by saying Badgett and Kendler, okay, that the commonalities between them, I think, are greater than the differences. Um, both of them are concerned with the international lender of last resort um, for, for what they see as an emerging global economy. And they're worried that the central bank that is that is uh, going that is that is being this responsibility is being thrust upon them, um, is not really ready for this. You know, so Badgett is worried that the Bank of England is not fit for purpose, and, and Kinberg is worried that the Federal Reserve is maybe not fit for purpose. Um, and uh, the emerging global economy um, that they see, uh, it's important. It, they're not really thinking about this, you know, as supply chains and so forth. It's it's the single global money market and single global capital market um, with its center in London and, and New York, um, respectively. Um, and there are these triggering events for both of these books. It's the the French indemnity, huge loan that France floated in 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 London in 1872, which which really brought to Badgett's attention this idea that this is the world capital market right here in London, and uh, it needs a it needs a more adequate backstop than the Bank of England is prepared. Um, the thing that really I think triggered Kindleberger in writing Mania's Panics and Crashes was Nixon's abrogation of 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 Bretton Woods in 1971, um, taking the dollar off gold. Um, so that's what this is the context in which they're writing these these books. I also want to uh, point out that both of them also are writing at a time against academic orthodoxy of their time or the emerging academic orthodoxy of their time. So I just, uh, it's, Badgett was writing really, I think, against Jevons, um, Money and the Mechanism of Exchange. Um, I talk about that a bit in the paper. Kindleberger um, against the emerging uh, orthodoxy. Uh, Diamond Divvig, famous paper, Bernanke, 1983. These are mentioned in the paper that Valtra um, put on the on the on the uh, on the reading list. Um, so I want to contrast um, with that. And here's just uh, I will just assert, okay, that I read both Badgett and Kindleberger as sort of proto money view thinkers. Um, and I'll just point up about a few little features of them that I notice. Um, and, and that's what separates them from sort of orthodox economics and finance. Um, this point of view, um, I, I noticed there was a lot of talk in previous sessions of this of this seminar about solvency. Um, so the money view tends to see solvency as accounting fiction, whereas liquidity is a market fact, um, that the, the economy is a web of time-dated promises to pay, stretching into the future, but not to infinity, that that it is that intertemporal equilibrium is not a helpful understanding of the of the world. Um, money is a means of payment, not a medium of exchange. It's a means of settling a debt, is what I is what I mean. Not not sort of the the grease uh, but between exchange of goods. Um, money and finance is the infrastructure of the market economy. It's not a sector of the economy, the financial sector, um, definitely not a veil. So money is never neutral. Um, a key emphasis in the money view is on settlement. Um, I noticed in previous sessions, Katerina mentioned the survival constraint. So that's that was Minsky's word for this. But but settlement in general um, is the point at which you find out whether that promise to pay is actually paid. Um, it comes due. Um, and that's the key moment. That's where market coordination happens um, in the money view. Not so much like in Valrasian equilibrium, a vector of relative prices, um, but this ability to meet your promises um, when they come due. Um, there's an asset pricing angle to that as well. The thinking of asset prices being being formed in dealer markets. Okay. So these are these are not just uh you know forward looking, you know, like in 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 finance. Um, and liquidity is not uh, is not assumed to be a zero price. In fact, in general, there's a liquidity premium in prices. It might be small in ordinary times. Um, and then in in crisis times it can be very large. Um, I'm, I added this third bullet point here about essential hybridity. I, I, this seminar is very interested in the in where does the state come into all of this. Um, so I will just emphasize here at the beginning, and we can I'm sure we'll get we'll be pushed back in in, in the conversation afterwards. Um, view I, I the money view very much tries to develop a theory of money and finance 
that does not have the state in it at the beginning, okay, and then bring the state in as a user of this infrastructure, a supporter of it, you know, other, it, it becomes, it's a, it's a hybrid structure. So it's not that the state plays no role, um, but it is a user of this infrastructure, just as everybody else is a user of this, of this infrastructure for government finance, for monetary stabilization purposes, sure. for global interface uh, management of the global interface of your of your nation state with the rest of the world regulation enforcement. So we will. Uh, that's just by way of prov provocation here at the beginning. So budget versus Kindleberger. So uh, I see, a, as I say, I I see them both as money viewers. I see them both as as a lot of commonality. But they're talking about different worlds. Um, so for for Badgett, he definitely is a gold standard guy. He's not imagining a fiat standard at all. Um, and he thinks that gold is 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 a key uh, is key to the international character of the sterling system. Um, maybe external discipline of the Bank of England. Um, that's what why you need to raise rates. It's this it's in in a time of crisis um, because of the the uh, the the outflow. Uh, whereas Kindleberger is really speaking in a time of a fiat standard, it's true that that it was it was bad. It was uh, Nixon in 1971 taking the dollar off gold um, that embraced a fiat standard. But he thought it was a fiat standard before that. It was a dollar standard that this gold thing wasn't wasn't so uh, wasn't wasn't so important. Um, the the important there therefore what what the important thing that nixon did in 1971 was to say that the us central bank is no longer going to be taking responsibility for the global dollar system we're going to be going it alone we're just concerned about the united states that's what worried him in 1971 um again the difference between Badgett and kindleberger um the banking business has evolved quite a bit um so Kindle, Badgett's world is a world of commercial bills um, his concept of liquidity is is it will will come to a sort of funding liquidity, um, whereas modern banking, shadow banking, um, uh, shiftability. This was already true when Kindleberger was writing in seventy eight. It's even more true today. Um, shadow banking, which I define as money market uh, funding of capital market lending, um, both of them also are are writing in in a in a sort of background of empire. It's explicit empire in 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 Badge's case, where the Indian structural surplus um, is support. The sterling system, and in in Kindleberger's case, the U.S. is is operating as Bank of the World, um, and uh, that that's what supports the dollar. That the the world continues to want to accumulate dollar reserves because it's uh, as as deposits in in New York banks, um, and uh, and that supports the demand for the dollar. Um, this is a story that I tell in my my book that was mentioned. Matthias mentioned. So here's now some. Uh, some concrete um, in the in the prep call for this, uh, Matthias said it would be good to hear how how you what do you mean by liquidity. So here's what I mean by liquidity, and this goes back actually. Um, Charlie Calamaris mentioned this this uh, Bernmeier and Peterson paper about funding and market liquidity. So I'm I'm mentioning three three concepts of liquidity: monetary liquidity, funding liquidity, and market liquidity. And I'm showing here um, in 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 uses and sources uh, uh, accounts like the flow of funds accounts, um, imagining that there's a deficit agent um, that therefore has um, more expenditures than receipts, um, and there's a surplus agent that has more receipts than expenditures, and so the deficit agent faces the problem of how do I pay. Given that I am making more payments than I'm receiving, um, that's what it means to be a deficit agent. And the first instance is is monetary liquidity, meaning using your balances of money. So that's the bottom line there, M for money, um, where you you have a you have a hoard of these monetary assets. It's a deposit account um, in general that you are using to pay to the surplus agent. So you're dishoarding, and the surplus agent is hoarding, and that's a that that's a, a sort of basic form of of liquidity um, that does not require anyone that that the surplus agent um, accepts that cash as payment. That's what it means for it to be a means of payment um, that it, you settle debts with it. So so that's not problematic. 
But the next two, funding and market liquidity, create some elasticity in all of this because you might run out of money balances. Um, in fact, typically you run out of money balance. So more, more generally, the way people uh, meet deficits at the settlement is by pushing them into tomorrow. So you borrow, uh, promising to pay back tomorrow, um, and and the surplus agents may lend, uh, and so that that uh, then you don't have to have money balances, um, and and you can create. Uh, you, this credit is is a, is a kind of elasticity um, around the discipline of of settlement and money. Um, you could also sell sell an asset, so liquidation um, in and accumulation. But in both cases, this elasticity comes from finding a willing counterparty. Okay, um, there has to be somebody willing to take the other side of that transaction. Otherwise, you're back to having to pay money. You promised to pay money. Now you have to pay money. So this elasticity is sort of not necessarily there um, when you need it. And that's why I point to the second set of ba the second balance sheet here, where I'm showing um, banks the the alchemy of banking, the ability of a bank to basically create more of the means of payment um, just by expanding their balance sheet on both sides. And I'm showing lender of last resort as essentially uh, a, a kind of funding liquidity where you're you're creating uh, additional money and lending it to the deficit agent who can then spend it to to to, to meet his deficit. Um, and dealer of last resort where you're 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 creating money to to purchase a security from the deficit agent. And the deficit agent can so that's the liquidation me mechanism. So there's this elasticity of credit uh, that that in the private sector um, with with non bank agents, okay. And there's there's a backstop in the banking system, and then of course the central bank is a backstop to that backstop. So there's layers of of this liquidity that goes on, and and here's the hierarchy. I, I noticed in this seminar, people are using this word, the hierarchy of, of money and credit. So that's all to the good. So here's the hierarchy uh, as I would suggest it is, um, that securities at the bottom are promises to pay, which are which are generally promises to pay deposits. Okay, bank deposits are promises to pay currency or the liability of the central bank. Uh, the central bank is a promise to pay international money. So that what counts as money, what counts as credit, uh, depends on where you are in the system, and it's a hierarchical system by construction. This seminar is very interested in questions of power, um, and uh, I have generally not been thinking about power here, but it is hierarchy, um, and it is definitely true that that the person who the, the layer that can create money for the for to for to help the layer below that's 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 a kind of power. Um, the question I have that, that we might want to talk about is whether that whether it's the hierarchy that is the source of the power or whether there's some previous sort of origin of power that that creates this hierarchy um, or maybe they are mutually supportive or something in in general in the money view we think that agents that have sort of structural surpluses that there that there are cash flows moving in their direction um their liabilities develop can develop some money like uh properties so they you would ask where who who are the structural surplus agents and and why that would be a way to address that question this hierarchy is also geopolitical, I guess, or or, or global. I noticed there's an international hierarchy of money with the dollar on the top, okay? And then the next layer down is various currencies of the global north. Um, the next layer down, various currencies of the global south. And the next layer down, um, everyone everyone else. Um, and uh, this... To be to be even more more uh, provocative, um, this hierarchy is also a hierarchy of hybridity. That at the top of this system, um, mostly we're dealing about about uh, private credit. That the glo global dollar um, is the liability of global banks largely. Okay, um, the stuff the offshore dollar is the liability of of private banks. Um, the Fed is the lender of last resort, um, and it, and U.S. monetary policy is global monetary policy. Um, what the Fed does is to set the overnight interest rate that everyone else follows. Um, that's what's happening right now. In the last two years, um, Powell. Um, moving from zero to five percent, we can talk about that. Um, the next layer down, as I say, the global north. Um, those central banks um, are have a quite different role than the Fed um, because they're just managing their spread against the dollar rate um, in order to to um, affect uh, uh, their own policy in order to concern with balance of payments. 
So these are the major currencies: um, uh, euro, the euro, the yen, the uh, uh, British pound, so so forth. Um, and uh, then there's the global south or the mi miners. These are words in in currency trading too, um, where this is more of a public. It's a, a more public, less private, less developed financial systems. Um, so the central bank and the treasury plays a, a larger role, um, not just not just affecting the price, but but maybe d absolute c capital controls and exchange rate controls and so forth. Um, so that there's a hybridity that there's a hy hybrid at every layer, but the relationship between public and private, between state and private are 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 different. Um, and uh, why is that not going now? There we go. Um, so here's an image. Maybe I should have put this paper um, on the on, as as a reading too. Where's my swap line? So this is a description of the of the of the way the Fed backstops the global system currently. Okay. Um, the the shaded region shows um, the where the Fed is backstopping, and you can see that at the top of the system, we learned in the COVID crisis and also in the global financial crisis that if need be, the Fed is willing to backstop the money market and the capital market in the United States, um, and it will reach its arms around all of those, uh, the mortgage-backed securities in particular in, 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 the, in the global financial crisis. Um, in terms of its lender of last resort to other countries, um, the liquidity swaps that it has with major central banks in the global north, um, I suggest means that it is backstopping global money markets, okay? But not global capital markets, um, just, just money markets. Um, and this new FEMA repo facility um, extends, uh, extends some lender of last resort, limited lender of last resort to the global south as well, or to any foreign or international monetary authority that has a treasury bill that it can that it can bring to the to the repo market. Um, I emphasize that this is that that what this is what these these trainer diagrams um, are showing that what the Fed is doing is 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 creating an outside spread. Um, it's not necessarily th this lender of last resort thing. Okay, is is about last resort. Um, it's an outside spread. It's not a penalty rate, but it's a it's a rate away from the market uh, in in its normal normal times um, and. So that's a fine, I guess. Um, and uh, so this is the last slide. Just some other issues that maybe we want to talk, come up in conversation. Um, quantitative easing, the zero interest rate policy, Silicon Valley Bank. I've seen the seminar seems very interested in this. Um, the fact that Silicon Valley Bank uh, was holding the reserves of, of this crypto uh, uh, currency, USDC. Powell's normalization going from zero to five. People are interested in payment of interest on reserves. COVID as war finance. There's a lot of places we can take this. Um, I will just stop here. Thank you very much. Um, that was really fascinating and provoking. I, I'm, I'm still a little bit, I think uh, what you, you said, um, we don't need a special theory for lender of last resort because it's just when we understand the system as it works currently, we understand also the lender of last resort. So I guess this has to do with making position and how you make positions. But you can get back to that on us once we had um, Waltraud having her presentation and then and then we can get to the discussion. Uh, Waltraud? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Um, let me just briefly go to my... No, it's doubling up. Sorry. Um, Bottom the, the the sign. I know. Uh, the problem is that this whole stuff is is on. I just cannot see because of the. Ah, now I can do it. Here we go. So thank you very much for having me. Uh. uh heterodox economist, but you know, uh, the heterodoxy is the new orthodoxy, as you will quickly see. And that is, um, I was once a heterodox Keynesian economist that uh, read Keynes as a, the uh, as a monetary theorist, which is clearly different from the American tradition. But um, as we see now, and Kindleberger was always there for a, a, a great figure for me, um, that you, that you, look at as a Keynesian as at money and finance and Keynes has basically money and finance in every big book that he has has written so 
Daychat versus Kindleberger, I do see much more difference than uh, Perry does. That doesn't mean and Kindleberger and in the later editions with Alibur uh, and Macaulay doesn't distance himself from uh, or themselves from Bayshot, but at the same time, it is too narrow. And this is going what I'm going to say. At the same time, Bayshot has made a contribution to the political economy of liquidity. So has Kindleberger. And this is the first point I want to make after I quickly review the difference between their uh, theory of the lending of last resort. And I do think we need a different theory for that particular situation. I don't think that you have on a daily basis the emergency liquidity management uh, that Perry sees working uh, in markets. Now, at the moment, markets are extremely always on the brink to some um, tantrum. But at the same time, I don't think that's a normal state of affairs. Then I make the argument why Kindleberger is more relevant for contemporary emergency liquidity management because his principle of what to do uh, implies that emergency liquidity management cannot be any more confined, and perhaps not even at his time in the 1980s, confined to lending of last resort by central banks only. Now, that may not be a discrepancy between Perry and myself, but I don't think that's how Beecher saw it. Um, so here is Bateshot's rule in his own words, and I'm grateful to Perry that he has forced me to read it really in the original. The end is to stay the panic, to stop the panic, and the advances should, if possible, stay the panic. And for this purpose, there are two rules. First, that these loans should only be made at a very high rate of interest. They will operate as a heavy fine on unreasonable timidity. And this is not saying what the central bank governor that he attacks in this chapter uh, says. It's what he says, a heavy fine. Uh, secondly, that at this rate, these advances should be made on all good banking securities and as largely as the public ask for them. Uh, because otherwise, you know, uh, they all panic if they're not sure if the solvent merchants and bankers uh, will, 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 will panic. Note also that the whole purpose of this is that the banking reserve may be protected as far as possible. So he really thinks in, a, in something that is a finite stock of liquidity, and you need to protect it as a central bank. That has to do with exactly what, what Perry said. He was in a different world, gold standard and all that. Uh, but at the same time, that did mean he did think not of let's abolish the gold standard in the, or uh, um, abandon the gold standard in such emergency situations. He, th he thought of this constraint as, as being absolutely there. Kindleberger says, on the other hand, uh, puts it down to kind of one principle. You need to give maximum elasticity of, of, of liquidity supply. The lender of last resort, whoever that is, it is not confined to the central bank, stands ready to hold a run out of real and illiquid financial assets. Real assets are included in this. So in other words, uh, uh, the metal that is abandoned or the, the, the housing estate that is no longer where the markets crash, prices crash, hold a run out of assets into money by making more money available. And that is any kind of assets and not confined to central banks, just to repeat that. And in the new book, Alibur et al., I don't know whether it's in the old version that you see here on the left, uh, this they they say on Bayshot's version of the lend of lend of last resort rather dryly, it faces the difficulty that both solvency and soundness depend on the course of the panic. In other words, when a panic cannot be stopped, then the good security goes. Uh, the fire sale of asset will of assets will drive down the prices of of anything and the 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 risk spreads up, 
and the goods the goods uh, security is nowhere it is becomes a, a junk bond um and the solvency then also goes and while i totally agree with Mar perry to say solvency is in a way an accounting or a legal fiction it is a binding fiction on on actors on traders in these markets and they have in principle to stop trading so don't quite know how you you know it may be a fiction but a, a, a socially quite binding fiction if you are somebody trading in these markets now to first to say why it's a good topic that we have today they speak to the political to political economy and to this political economy of liquidity in particular Bechot really talks about the social interaction under uncertainty. He he talks in this, it's in the end, it's two chapters until he develops then his role. And it's clear that he says that on the one hand, these actors, um, you know, ordinary men that have been put into uh, office a duty, have a public duty to perform being directors of the Bank of England, not prone to abstract thinking, he says. And therefore, they don't quite understand what they do, even though they sometimes do the right thing. Um, but it, when they later defend their action, they go back to uh, well, old, old style um, kind of discipline has to be uh, upheld and, and uh, quantity theory. While the traders, the practical people, just want to have liquidity that keeps them in the market and does, that doesn't challenge them and they they are also not abstract thinkers so that's why but but have in a way the right instinct that it's the liquidity that has to be provided these different frame, frames of mind make it however quite difficult because none, none understands basically why their practice is the right practice makes increases the uncertainty that in such a situation is in any case there where what you should do depends on what everybody else uh, would do and you may all rationally uh, get, go out of the market but then the market collapses he formulates a classic policy dilemma this you have seen this there the yeah. bank of england must guard against opportunistic behavior of traders who sell uh, uh, quickly and and want to get uh, you know cheap cheap finance um while at the, and that that's why you need a high rate of interest but it, you also need to give assurance to merchants of good standing the solvent ones that he just says they are still solvent under normal circumstances and you should therefore try trade uh, uh yeah uh, be, uh, use this, this, see these uh, securities as under normal circumstances a good security, and and that as that you take it. Kindleberger uh, is similar in the sense of takes this uncertainty very uh, uh, seriously, and insists that, however, such an uncontrollable dynamic cannot be uh, stopped by insistence on a penalty rate or a fine and good collateral because it ignores this endogeneity of what is, uh, uh, you know, what is a good security and what is solvency. He sees a systemic risk, not so much a behavioral problem and containing a panic driven by a fire sale of assets because he talks about these assets that calls for the unconditional liquidity supply. He talks later as well, it was not in the quote, but about this contested mandate that in a way that the Federal Reserve must assume and have his its international lender of last resort function for markets as a whole, as, um, as uh, Perry called it, the Fed must be willing to backstop uh, markets outside of, of its, its, its legal jurisdiction as part of providing this hegemonic stability. Uh, and that was another theory he had. Uh, I would like to add, this is like this US-centric view because obviously it's a bit like with the lending of last resort by the central bank. You don't do it out of the goodness of your heart, but by, because you want to stay in the game. Because if the whole infrastructure breaks down and the mess you have created by letting financial innovation rip through the system and then uh, nobody knew how many uh, risks they have loaded on their balance sheet, then in the end, you may also have to help a little bit with preventing the mayhem 
in that sense, I have not quite as benevolent a view of this hegemony. But that we can leave to the discussion. Now, interestingly, while I'm saying here, you know, look, uh, Kindleberger said it all. Kindleberger himself had doubts in later years. And you see here what's the background why we should discuss this. I mean, has he exactly foreseen what happened with this up, this is upward ratcheting of, of the balance sheets of the ECB and the Federal Reserve. He says in 1996 in a, in a uh, Henry Thornton lecture, I suggest that the world may have pushed the doctrine, the doctrine of life, the land of last resort, too far with deposit uh, insurance for commercial banks and thrifts. So he thought a deposit insurance is actually something that creates uh, too ready, uh, you know, a readiness to 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 engage in risky finance, uh, which is a relatively conservative view. I I mentioned I have here in bold the rescue from bankruptcy of such bodies as New York City. You could also say nation state like Greece or Ireland. Some corporations, such as Penn Central, Lockheed, and Chrysler Corporation, you know, the the Federal Reserve has massively bought up commercial papers. Banks too big to fail, even though their deposits exceed insured limits by wide margins. Many high-minded principles suffer from entropy or decay over time, and the lender of last resort principle may be one of them. So in a way, he goes, he re, he goes back on his own theory and says that it creates too much moral hazard, so endogenous risk-taking, because, you know, there's insurance or bailout capacity there. Now, I don't share that view. I would actually go with, with Kindleberger uh, against Kindleberger and say, you need to take exactly what he saw earlier and say emergency liquidity ma management is more than lending of last resort by central banks. If you leave the central banks alone with that task, yes, then they are financially dominated and will have to do it, but that's not the only alternative. On the one hand, central banks are absolutely essential. They have deep pockets because they can print that stuff with a stroke of a pen or now with a, you know, just add a zero or three to, uh, to the sum that's on the screen. It can contain panics at speed and scale. Those who obviously fiscal authorities should do it because they have the democratic legitimacy. I mean, how? Uh, the numbers are so much exceeding national budgets that you can simply not do that at the same speed and scale as we have needed in the last few years. Some central banks can make losses with impunity. You know, if the Brazilian central bank does it, then it may not go down so well with the markets. But the Bundesbank had historically often quite negative capital, um, and the Fed, nobody would give a toss whether they have negative capital standing there. Normally, the sign of insolvency, uh, because it doesn't matter. They will not be called out on it, or they pay uh, their uh, creditors those who have a claim in it, in exactly the thing that they can print. This is quite important because it is a precondition for market making of last resort, and that may be needed when asset markets are actually the problem and not a liquidity, a flow problem because of the, you know, different coming in and out of, 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 uh, of cash flows. The fiscal authorities... Now I don't know why it's not doing it. They can deal with this Bayshot dilemma um, because they can extend guarantees and attach strings that would rein in opportunistic behavior. For example, which actually central banks have done, not allowing to pay out uh, dividends or anything like that. They can replenish the dwindling stock of safe assets. The Fed has in recent, in, in those high crisis times, actually overissued treasury bonds that they, it didn't need for financing, but because in order to, to replenish uh, the, the, the volume of safe assets in markets. And it can pre-commit and should do that legally to levy sizable fees for the public service of bailing out banks afterwards. 
Many central banks and many fiscal authorities actually have done this. Uh, quite a few of, of European countries and the Fed and the United States have actually made quite a good profit on their bailout activity. And then the prudential regulators that must, they did always said they must come in to deal with the solvency problem and the, the central bank with the liquidity problem, like Perry, like uh, Charles Goodhart. That is always a, a convenient fiction, as if you could uh, differentiate between the two, these things. The, dif the difference between that is another of these endogeneities of a panic. They must, however, in advance, reduce the vulnerability to panics. To me, the prudential regulators today really have a bit more to say for themselves and justify their existence by having to this preventive TIF function. Because when the panic uh, runs, prudential regulators cannot really do very much. They must, for example, when uh, another of these masters of the universe that are so dumb uh, come along with another wonderful financial innovation, I think in particular of uh, crypto uh, finance, you must reverse the burden of proof. It's not for the regulator to prove that this is um, that they are right and that it is too dangerous. No, they must prove that this has a social value, and add something to the instruments of hedging, of uh, you know making liquidity in the market that isn't there now. And I would uh, bet with you that the crypto finance cannot stand these tests. They also, and that's important about the macro potential turn in regulation is they can exercise capital controls because macroprudential regulation is nothing else than segment markets and and do uh, what cannot uh, speak its name namely control capital my last uh, and that's my summary really really i think the doctrine of the land of last resort is a case of economic theory trailing actual practice. And that's my paper with Grossman and, and Rockoff. I mean, they show over and over again in history that the, the Bayshot doctrine, uh, lending at a penalty rate uh, against good collateral, has been more honored in the breach than in the uh, observance. And that's exactly the point. Why is that so? Kindleberger's theory of the land of last resort, that is that that body, that institution must uh, prevent that the illiquidity of the market, the systemic illiquidity when there's a run out of assets into money. That's the pertinent starting point for widening the perspective to emergency the liquidity management. He's not obsessed with central banks, this heroic story that we have these days, you know, that these uh, men in gray suits do it all for us. And it applies it to a wider set of markets, not only that, for bank credit as as um, as Beethoven does. And there are three lessons. Central bank liquidity alone may not stop a panic. You need more than that. Um, central banks need support from other institutional actors to escape that financial dominance. You need, for example, guarantees that tide uh, banks over the market so that it is not forced to bail out single institutions. And then market making of last resort may be required if asset markets are the locus of an emergency, something that uh, Willem Barter and, and Seibert have said actually before the crisis, and I think they were exactly right. And with Kindberger, it makes sense. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Waltraud. Really, I mean, both very thought-provoking and absolutely on time. Uh, this together is a, is a rare, rare gift. And so I already would like to thank you for this. I want to remind everybody in the room that you have the right, evidently, to post your questions. Those of you who have already written in the meantime, it wasn't always clear to me whether it was a question or a comment. So if you would like to restate your question, please feel free to either raise your hand or write it in the comment. I myself have prepared, prepared two, one for Perry and one for Waltraud. And I can see that maybe Nathan also would like to come in. Uh, Nathan Coombs, but let me start um, with uh, with Perry. And then, so my question to you is the following. I was starting to think about the notion of the penalty rate or the non-penalty rate, the high rate. And I realized, I think I realized that the problem really is in a market-based system that you really can't raise the rates too much or you get the systemic problem that you're trying to fight, right? So 
uh, in, is is that what you're getting at essentially that in the in the today's era when you were to apply a penalty rate to the discount of these assets you would engender then a liquid a negative liquidity spiral that you're trying to prevent is that possibly one of the concerns you're having or am i misreading you and, and that that also links to to the question of power i think because if the system is so leveraged that you can't apply the penalty rate, then the system forces the hand of the central bank. And that's what um, Waltraud just called, I think, financial dominance. And so my, my second question would be to, to Waltraud, and then the two of you can react, and then we, we open the floor, maybe. Um, uh, so I really, really enjoyed your second to last slide. And in a, in a, in a perfect world, that's exactly how it should be. Uh, reducing the vulnerability, the macroprudential regulation, and so on and so on. Um, isn't there, in the political economy of it, the fact that reacting to emergencies, in particular now after Lehman, after they tried once to, to let one go, their reaction is so immediately and so quick that no, and uh, Pierre Christian Fink is in the room, who's just written a, a brilliant piece on the 1974-1975 crisis, where he shows that that the emergency is so quickly uh, um, limited that there is afterwards no regulatory backlash. So there is no regulation. So the fire is extinguished so quickly that no action takes place. And so that the risk taking goes ever bigger and ever bigger so that the quick reaction of the central bank actually means that the other two elements that you're showing, in particular the third one for the financial regulator, is not happening. You know, isn't there a political economy link between these three? Isn't that normatively wishable, but positively almost impossible? If you, that would be my question. And, and then the two of you can react. And I, I see that. Uh, um, that Nathan has written something and then others will also write something, but please Perry and then Waltraud and then we open the floor. Um, let me loop, loop in the question um, that was in the chat about market microstructure, um, because I think that's related to your question. Um, so uh, I have read most of the literature in market 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 structure, the 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 piece the thing that I emphasize is the trainer model. Okay, in particular, um, which I think is not so much used in finance, um, but is it it is useful for for our purposes. The difference between what I do and what they do is the market the the standard finance market microstructure is is sort of trying to make markets more efficient or something that seems to be what they're what they're after okay where uh, whereas and they're thinking about individual markets so they're thinking about one a particular asset or something like this i i want to do macroeconomics with this okay and i also want to do monetary theory with this so i'm thinking about this is about the determination of the level of the rate of interest okay in 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 the market as a whole not uh, not not a uh, and and the way in which dealers um, provide an outside where the outside spread comes from, where the inside spread comes from, all of that apparatus, okay, is is my version, I guess, of market of market microstructure, um, and uh, and I use that model both for you know for overnight markets, for for three month markets, and for ten ten year uh, bond markets, hey. the same the same model, um, the so that's. In terms of how short rates affect long rates, okay, that's that's how, okay, that they that it's the the dealers who are making bond markets, you know, are borrowing in money markets in general to finance those positions. So when you are making it possible for them to hold their positions, then they don't have to liquidate them. They don't have to sell them. Um, so that's what you're trying to uh, avoid. Um, Sometimes it's not enough, and then the Fed com comes in and acts as a dealer itself and is buying these, you know, the mortgage-backed securities that the Fed the Fed bought during the during the crisis, and the bonds, the corporate bonds that it promised to buy, you know, in in the COVID crisis, it, it didn't wind up having to buy any of them, but it prom its promise to buy them was enough to stabilize to stabilize the market. So there, we could speak about this for hours, but that's at least the direction that the money view would 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 lead you to. Those three boxes, those three time trainer diagrams, one overnight, one three month, one 10 year, 
are connected because the dealers each one is borrowing from the lower from the lower level and that's the transmission the monetary transmission mechanism um from the thing that the fed does control directly overnight interest rate you know to to prices that are more endogenous in in, in the in the world mm -hmm. great okay um Altraud, and then we have uh, three questions that can then be asked by the persons who wrote uh, i can be really short um I think, Matthias, you would let the the central banks off the hook, or they are the predicament that we have created by having such a, a central bank heavy type of emergency uh, management. You let that off the hook too easily if you say, "Oh, they don't get at the regulators." Yes, the regulators have must have made some mistake because they allow things that should have never been allowed, like never to ask how these, this securitization happened um, and if it's just done in order to, to uh, sell it uh, on. But at the same time, the situation that we have now and there is an awareness was is, is that the, 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 the emergency liquidity management has itself created the potential for the next emergency because the liquidity and the, the leveraging in markets is just so high and it has uh, funded what... Um, many say now it's a shadow banking system, but it's a whole new range of things that are not even shadow anymore. They're quite obviously there. And a lot of legislative activity has happened. I mean, from Marco Prudential to this body of, you know, these, I don't know, MIFID, the directive, the mother of all EU directives. Nobody has probably read it. Uh, any living being cannot read such stuff. The same, however, with the legislation in, in the US. And therein lies also a problem. You regulate ever more these tiny little things that then are not implemented. I mean, Katarina would be able to say much more on this, so I stop here. Thank you. This is great. So uh, great comments, great reply. So we have Nathan, who's surrounded by, who can't speak loudly. So I can, uh, I will read his question and then Gang Ma and uh, uh, Madame Galpern can read theirs or can state theirs. So Nathan writes, thank you for the fascinating presentations. I would like to ask what the speaker think is at stake in the differences between Badger and Kindleberger. I can't see a huge analytical difference, but there seem to potentially be significant normative divergences. So if you could react to that, then we have Gang Ma, Anna Gelpan, and Tobias Four. So it will be four. And I just take so many questions because we have so limited time. So I apologize for that. Gang Ma. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, great. Uh, yes, I, I just, I just wonder, you know, what are the limits of this, uh, you know, central bank as a last resort, right? You know, so also related to you know previous question, you know, so you quickly, uh, you know, put off the the the, the financial crisis. Uh, seems like you know, yeah, that's just the, the what are the limits, you know? So really, you know, that's just a, it's a system, our system, you know, as long as we have a very capable uh, central bank. There will be no financial crisis anymore. Yeah, you know, I just don't know, right? You know, just wonder. Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Me, uh, Thanks very much. Um, I am curious about kind of the linguistic creep, I guess. Um, and uh, wondering to what extent does it make sense to talk about a uh, lender of last resort function for political and in particular, be it New York City or Greece, um, are we sort of financializing politics or is it pre-financialized? Thank you. Thank you. One last comment by Tobias, and then we'll have a round of answers, and then there's going to be another round of questions. Tobias. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, I thought both presentations were really thought-provoking, and I was wondering what uh, Perry and Waltrud make of, you know, Bad job in some other writing seems to be a great fan of free banking, right? So he says, you know, why do we have one central bank when we have many pin factories? So how do we square on the one hand is recognition that we end up with a system where we need a central bank, but really the system we ought to have is one of free banking. You know, how do those two visions fit together in your mind? Thank you. Now, either of you can start. I 
Um, well, maybe I'll I'll I'm this. There's too much here. <laughs> um, maybe I'll carve off a little piece of it. Um, the um, this first question, what's at stake? Divergence. Um, I, I think one of my arguments is that in fact, analytically, they are very similar. Okay. Um, the the what you're detecting, I think, as the difference between them um, comes from another hundred years of 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 banking experience. I think that uh, that Badgett really does think that lender of last resort is is enough. That's the the limits. He's trying to argue we need to have, to be have a lender of last resort. By the time the Kindleberger comes around, he's had this experience in the Depression, and he does not believe that lender of last resort would have been enough to prevent the Great Depression. Depression. You know, his book on the Great Depression, The World of Depression, 1973, okay, which he wrote before Mania's Panis and Crashes. Okay. He says there's three things you need from, from the leader. Okay. The first one, or he lists the third, actually, is, is lender of last resort. But you also need uh somebody to step in to stabilize commodity markets. Um, and you also need somebody to step in to provide uh long-term lending, uh capital markets. So capital markets and commodity markets. He, he said. The breakdown of those two things is what caused the Great Depression. Okay, that's not necessarily the central bank. He's not the, necessarily thinking that that's the central bank, but somebody has to do that. Um, or and then after in the second edition of 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 uh, World and Depression, he added two more because there was this experience of flexible exchange rates. So exchange rate management and also macro policy coordination. So he's now got five things. Okay, that you need a, a central stabilizer to do. Okay. In my talk, I was really just focusing on the very, the very first one. You know that that the that lender lender of last resort is about creating new money, and who can create new money? It's the central bank. It's the liability of the central bank. So that is the core. You know, around which everything else uh, is 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 built. Um, and so that's what I wanted to. That's what I wanted to emphasize. Um, the I, I I would not. I think it is useful to distinguish between that and all these other dimensions um that that may be necessary stabilization in a complicated modern economy um and there is mission drift and you know the central bank is a is subject to political pressures um and winds up doing things it doesn't want to do in general the fed does not take credit risk okay it it somebody else is taking the credit risk if you see how all of their all their facilities are so they are trying to limit their own intervention to lender of last resort, but there, I, I think that is true. The Fed would like not to have more responsibility than it already than it already has, and I think that's in general true of central bankers. Um, they're not there. That's that's the central banking ethos uh, in, in a way. When you see this, this is what I tell my students all the time. When you see the central banker doing doing a lot of things like those diagrams that Valtern was showing you, okay. It suggests failure somewhere else in the in the economy. You know, central banks should not be doing so much. Um, and uh, I, I so I think that's that's maybe uh, where I'll where I'll, I'll leave it for that. Yes, thank you. There'll be another round. So, uh, Leithard, Nathan, I see it almost. It's interesting how you how you formulate it, and being pushed. I would almost say I see it the other way around. I see a deep analytical difference and it may have to do with the historical situation and it's i'm not blaming nature for anything but he thinks the money's supply should be or the liquidity supply needs to be finitely inelastic otherwise these chances will get at you and and a macroeconomist like like uh, kinderberg said at that point forget it i mean it has to be elastic and as much as the market wants you deal with the chances afterwards, the opportunistic, uh, those who free ride basically on the central bank. So there is an analytical difference in what they see should be, so to speak, what the, the lender of last resort does. Normatively, I have the impression, even in this quote of Bechard and of Kindleberger, especially later, that they think it's something that should not have to be done, but it has to be done in capitalist economies that have this tendency in their financial markets to go uh, into uh, panics, manias, and crashes. Right? So there I see it almost, they are similar. Gangma, I have nothing to add to what Perry said. I see it exactly like he does. And I Galpin, that's a, a really difficult question. Um, 
and I may have, and Kindleberger may have, you make me aware of that, we may have used the wrong uh, examples. So that the better example for lending of last resort to public entities like countries, like uh, cities, would be the that the ECB was forced to to basically accept every uh, every bond in 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 um, retro in repo financing or in bond purchases that it would normally not do and that the market didn't want to hold anymore. I mean, for example, in particular, Italy and Spanish bonds, Italian and Spanish bonds. At that point, there was a real risk that otherwise. They would the spillover from this would create such problems for these these countries in their their treasuries that we would have the next then swapping over into insolvency or simply an illiquidity of countries that have constantly had a deficit because the Great Recession had really uh, ravished their their public finances um, and that was a, a consequence of the of the financial crisis. So in that sense, I think one can talk about lending of last resort, but you have a point, of course, that one needs to be much more specific if one would really write about this, because we know that, unfortunately, public bodies have no right to go insolvent and write off some of their debt, and they rather have to work it off through austerity and such uh, counterproductive policies. Tobias, I mean... That's interesting, and I knew that once that Bechard actually was a free banker, uh, and that is itself a bit revealing to me. Sorry, Perry, but that really shows he has this limited perspective of somebody, the man of the markets, the economist who writes for these traders and defends them. Um, his sociology, the economic sociology that he has is, is quite interesting. Um, and he thinks there is this instinctive knowledge of traders, but it also shows the limits of this, because I frankly think free banking is just not possible. I mean, you would have mayhem and chaos. It's like this idea of we could bring the, the euro into through uh, benevolent currency competition. Well, thank you. I mean, we had a, a little taste of that in 1992, 93. These ideas that uh, Major had and his Tories uh, at the time it just show that you that you don't understand what money is, namely the ultimate means of no. settlement. Thank you. Okay. I will just continue speaking. So we have uh, uh, Katarina and then we have Yanis Siligakis as well as uh, one more, Yang Kim, I think. Katarina? I just want to come back to the question of, of hierarchy and power. And I think this also relates to Anna's questions about what's the difference between a city, a state, and a corporation. And I think it, you know, it depends really on the relative monetary sovereignty of these public entities. So you have to be monetarily sovereign to play the game of a, um, you know, lender of last resort. So you must issue your own currency and you must issue most of your debt in your own currency too and under your own laws. Otherwise, you look more like a corporation. So, you know, I think cities are more like corporations, even if they're not for profit. And Argentina looks more like a private corporation to me. Right. So there's a, there, and that, of co course, is and then that also, I think, relates to the question about how are these hierarchies created? It's, of course, part of the political um, uh, geopolitical economy that we are finding ourselves in. It's not an accident that first England and then the United States just hoarded all the gold and was able to control the global monetary system. So you're you're an empire you, um, and, and not just a, a central bank. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I'm just, I've been thinking while I was listening to this debate on from the political economy perspective about um, uh, Charles Tilley's art article about um, uh, 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 organized, uh, war making and state making is organized crimes. And he basically says, this is how states emerge. It's basically you have to think like mafias. And if you are the bigger guy and you can get more um, friends on your side and you can bribe more clients, you can then show, slowly but surely sort of expand that, that your empire. At some point, you make concessions um, and you bureaucratize and you create the rule of law and all these institutionalizations. But at the heart, of course, there is a power struggle. And that, that is very real. But what we see reflected in the global hierarchy of money, I think, are 
power struggles that are not only in the past, but they continue in the present, of course. Um, and, and I think we I would like to bring this more in. It's not just a technocratic thing, but I think there is dominance, not only by private players, there's also dominance by public players. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the question of power and hierarchy played back to the both of you. Now we have Yanis and then Mr. Kim. Yanis? Yes, uh, I, thank you. I have two questions. The, the, the first one is also picking up on Katarina's question on power. And my question was, if the power of money printing or like liquidity injection could be decentralized, not in the terms of who issues it, but where does it go to? So it shouldn't go to institutions, it should go directly to citizens, and then citizens should develop a higher sense of responsibility and agency over the money supply. Okay, that's, 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 that's number one. Do you think that's, that's feasible? That, that's the, the first question. The second question, it uh, goes back to the to the lender of last resort and the connection with the 1929 crisis and how could it be solved. And my question is, does it sound reasonable to you that when we have an economic barrel which is punctured all over, right, and it's losing, you know, water left and right, that we should do a liquidity injection back into it before puncturing the holes. If if we don't puncture the holes first, all we are doing is we are perpetuating and putting more money into the pockets of those that emptied the economic barrel to begin with and created the crisis. So how do you think that these checks on who bleeds the economy out of money um, you know, can be implemented. Thank you. Thank you. One last question by, um, uh, I think Mr. Kim. I find him, I, I don't know, young Kim. How to see the difference between money as medium of exchange and money as means of payment? It's a question relating back to a comment made earlier by Perry. So I'll give it back now to Waltraud and uh, to Perry. Maybe Waltraud would like to start this time, then Perry, and then we can see if there's one more question. Um, on the one hand, I, I agree with you. It is a lot about monetary sovereignty and why in lending of last resort suddenly <clears throat> this hierarchy uh, emerges. You know, everybody runs into the dollar, even though... It emerged in dollar markets in which European banks and so on was heavily involved, but that is the usual uh, playbook. And therefore, the United States, that's what I earlier said, when Paris says the, the Fed was willing to, well, it had created the mayhem partly by sitting on its hands forever and not doing anything about this, this over, you know, the, the Greenspan put and all these things we discussed, that then it had to underwrite the whole system that was based on Dollar, in the end of on dollar as the reserve currency. While I agree with you that one could bring power into it, I find it, when I taught it and, and talked about financial power, I always ended up with saying to the students, I'm sorry that I can't show you where it's exercised. It is elusive. To me, the problem is that it is, the way you formulated it, it sounds to me too act percentage. And that's the problem. It is somewhere in the functioning of a system. Again, why I like Kindleberg or think Kindleberg is more pertinent because it isn't showing, the, you know, certain individuals. While in the end, yeah, individuals have made decisions and exploited situations, and then when it went bust, uh, they socialized all the all the the, the losses that they had. Um, Yanis. The decentralized liquidity to individuals could easily be uh, provided if we had digital, if central and central banks playing with this, with the digital currencies that they are thinking about, because you could actually take the payments function out of the banking system, and perhaps some of the hope is that you could then let 
a few more of them fail when push comes to shove. We will see whether it works because I think they will they will go over to digital currencies. And it would have that in directly or indirectly, we would all have an account with a central bank that could, in that case, give us a liquidity. Because today, why banks have such a liquidity problem in the narrow sense, not in the sense that Anna and, and Katarina were talking about, has to do with that they provide us a service. With deposits, you 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 know, I, I put in a, a euro or a dollar and I can withdraw a euro or a dollar for that. It's not changing with, it has no market valuation. It's normally fixed. And with that, we then know we can also pay our rent and things like that, things that actually change. And that creates a, a illiquidity, a, a problem for them. In that sense, if you want banks to have a payments function, there is a certain obligation of why central banks have to do lending of last resort. That was the origin. But we have, of course, gone way over this and that investment banks that had no role and took no deposits whatsoever, like Goldman Sachs and all of them, could then muscle themselves into the Fed shows that problem that Kindleberg in 1996 uh, 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 shows. That he said, this doctrine has been overstretched. And to some extent he's right, but then the point is not to to deny this, but to to change it to a wider notion of emergency liquidity management, I think. Uh, I leave the second question to to Perry. It's way too difficult for me. Thank you. Um, well, <laughs> I can't remember which one was the second one, which one was the first one. Um, there are uh, many of these require more thinking. Um, the specific one that was addressed to me was medium of exchange versus means of payment. Um, this is a this is a reference to the the way sort of standard economics understands money um, as as double coincidence of wants, you know, that that the that that what it's solving is this problem that um, I I I may not want what what you're selling, um, but you want what I what, what how can we get over the inconvenience of barter and so forth? And so there's this whole story about about uh, monetary economics that starts from that as the problem. And I'm saying that the, the money view starts in a very different place, okay? It says that that transactions are made with promises to pay in general, okay? Um, and that these promises to pay then have their own life, okay? And and they're tested when that time of, of payment comes due. And so they're tested by, can you come up with the means of payment? That's what payment means, is, 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 is providing cash. So starting from there gives you a different monetary theory than starting from the notion that there's some inconvenience of barter. Um, and so that's a, a longer, there's, but it is quite foundational. So you're quite right to pick up that I'm making that distinction and that that means that, means that you're going to have a different, a different monetary theory. By the way, um, Kindleberger is very clear about this. Money is a means of payment. If you read him, he, he understands that. He understands that and that that is, that he's deviating from his colleagues. Okay. In, 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 in that regard. Um, I think Katerina, that's maybe more a you were making a comment more than asking a question. So I'll just take that. Um, it is a question, you know, the the technocratic uh, aspect of this, okay, which you know some minds find fascinating, and you can get lost in it. Um, I think it's also extremely important, okay, not to just use power as a shortcut to say things happen because this one has power and this one does not have power. It's like, it's actually a pretty complicated system. How actually does it work? What is the link between short-term interest rates and long-term interest rates? How the technocratic stuff is the mechanism, and it's it needs to be understood. Um, and it is it is too much of a shortcut. And it's even as if you're trying to reform the system and make it make it better, just getting rid of the people with power is not. It, it, it you need to you need to know how the system works, okay, in order to reform it. Um, and that's where I would start. Um, and uh, it's not easy. I think I agree that Badgett, you know, he he's a conservative country banker is what he is. And he, he is talking about free banking. 
he's admiring what he imagines the American system is, okay, which is they don't have a central bank, right, at that time that he's writing, 1873, there is no central bank. And so he's writing in admiration of this. It's He didn't really understand, I think, how America worked. There was a central bank. It was J.P. Morgan, as a matter of fact, you know, in in in, in New York. Um, and it was a hierarchical system with clearing systems in, in different... It, he didn't understand how... I think, again, he is the conservative banker, and, he, and he's trying to say... Well, maybe we wouldn't like to have a central bank, but we have one, you know, and so we have to, it, it, he is again giving, he's, he's, an, he's giving, giving his opponents um, a, 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 an idea that he's on their side, that they don't like the centralized power. Okay, I get it. You don't like the centralized power, but, but we have it. We have to deal with it. Um, and this is exactly how he spoke about, you know, how, how parliament is organized and how the government is organized. It's like, you know, you wouldn't do that if you were trying to rationally organize, but this is what we have. These are the institutions we have. And so we have to, he's a Darwinian in this regard, right? He's imagining that these are institutions that have evolved um, it, over time. Um, no one planned it, you know, no one would plan it. Okay. But here we are. These are the, these are the animals in our forest and we have to get along with them. Yeah. I, I want to give the last uh, uh, moment, maybe a question, I mean, to uh, Christine Desan, who has raised her hand, and uh, and if I forgot somebody who hasn't spoken yet, then just put yourself on the list. So last round, uh, Christine first, please. Yeah, thanks very much. A totally fascinating set of presentations um, that I really enjoyed and appreciated. Um, I guess I'll pick up Perry with our perennial debate. Uh, which I understood you to be provoking me to do about you know whether whether the private comes first or the public comes first and 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 ask you um, actually one one way to pose the question is to say what's at stake in that debate for you why the emphasis on why the private comes first which is of course the dominant tradition I mean it's the one place where you're really not heterodox where you're more orthodox and and one way to get at that question is to ask, of, uh, we agree on so much. I mean, of course, money is a means of payment, um, but a means of payment and all endogenous systems of payment of credit require a unit of account. Um, and a unit of account depends on regimes of credit and contract and obligation that are publicly constituted. Those things are not spontaneous creations, but in fact are domestic legal institutions, right? Legal creations. And in particular, again and again, we see private endogenous systems of credit using and anchored on public uh, systems of endogenous credit creation, right? So the use of a public liability based on public obligation. So so the original purveyor of endogenous credit and the and therefore the supplier of the unit of account again and again, turns out to be the sovereign, seems not coincidental, right? But um, but enabling, especially when we think about all the work, credit, property, contract, these are legal concepts and obligations. Um, and I think that character actually does take us to power. So I think, uh, you know, the technocratic is ultimately enabled and facilitated by these legal institutions, which are, um, Uh, domestic systems, and uh, even if they escape the control of domestic authorities, which uh, which I really liked uh, 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 Professor Shekel's um, uh, uh, description of the burden of proof. So, um, so love to hear you both speak to that question. Well, then that's a big question. So, <laughs> um, cool. yes. Yeah, so that's that. We we could have a whole session about that. Um, what's at stake? It, it maybe is something different for me than for you. You're in a, in, in a law school. Uh, my One of the things that's at stake for me, okay, is in fact, it, it is not the case that standard economics um, puts the private first in money terms, right? There, there is, there is this idea. There's actually an article coming out in the Journal of Economic Literature, um, just, just the next issue, where, where it's pointed out that, 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 in, in the standard economic models, unless there's a central bank, you don't have a theory of the price level. That the central bank 
creates creates the price level. It also creates the nominal rate of interest. That all seems to me crazy. We haven't always had central banks. What's your theory of prices? If you don't have a theory of prices without a central bank, then I think you don't have a theory of prices. You know, that's just a deus ex machina that you're that you're you're dropping onto. Them. So you you want to have a theory of where does the interest rate come from that does not say the central bank sets it. Like where, what would happen? There were interest rates before there were central banks. So where does the interest rate come from? What is it? What is that market doing? And then the central bank intervenes as a player in that market um, and pushes it around and takes responsibility for it and so forth. Um, and and that's that's for me the the basic analytical strategy. Okay, is to is to try to say, well, how 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 does it, what are the underlying ways the system works and where does the where does the central bank get leverage over it where where you know you you could you could tell a whole story that doesn't have a central bank at all that's modern finance mostly okay but i think that just shows you there's something wrong with modern finance that they don't have money in there in the right way they don't have they're assuming that the price of liquidity is zero that's a nice analytical abstraction to help you with other parts of your theory but it's not true about the world Similarly, you know, as I say, this this article that's going to come out um, that that oh the price level is determined by the central bank. I think it's not true. It's true in your model. I think it's not true in the world. Um, and so that's why I'm trying to keep my attention on on those on those matters. And perhaps that's you know I I think we can uh, we're fighting different battles. Maybe is the <laughs> is the is is the difference. That's for Christine. <laughs> okay. Uh, Walter, would you like to get in one more time? I would just like to say I I was also not quite sure how this is something because sometimes public is first and private second or whatever. So I would simply say money, modern money, fiat money is public. That's why free banking is an impossibility. Those who tried it uh, abandoned it. The United States has an experience with that in the 19th century, I think. Um, and at the same time, uh, you need, and this is all that is technocratic in the sense of stabilizing the system. And you may think capitalism should not be stabilized, it should just go. But given that we analyze something that is, I'm just saying you need then an actor that is public and uh, that has the deep pockets and can make um, uh, the, the, the losses that occur in a banking panic when everything is repriced and re, uh, revalued. Uh, and for, for that, that's no private actor can do that. No, they have budget constraints. While a central bank has in within the realm of the possible, usually no budget constraint, because it, it is a sheer accounting uh, convention that you write on their liability side, the money stock. They, they, if you go to the central bank and, and hand in some money, you get it to, to get back some money in a different denomination. So, and the key function is to me not the your unit of account that can indeed be privatized as you have in dollarized economies, but whether you can uh, whether you can fulfill a contract, the legal tender function, the payments function, and that means that those who have have got money in return have no claim anymore against somebody else. They have it against the central bank. And as I said, that is a fiction. Um, in that sense, there is something special about central bank money. And I think it can only be a public function, at least in the capitalism as I know it. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it's 7.40 now. We're 10 minutes over. And... Uh, I would like to thank all of you for attending and I will be uh, so strict to suggest that we should come to an end now. I uh, It's deeply inspiring. It's also very, very deep. Uh, uh, these debates on money, Keynes theory of money comes into the picture immediately. And uh, I hope we can just uh, pick up again where we started, where we stopped here today in a month from now on the 25th of March when we discuss the global unit of account, namely the dollar, and the role of the Fed in setting, as Perry put it, uh, the overnight interest rate for the globe, where everybody has to adjust to it and what that means for the Fed. Uh, you'll get a message about this soon, and uh, uh, we hope you have the time to, to join us again.
thank you for today. It was really a wonderful discussion, and I'm really happy that we have recorded this <laughs> because it's. Uh, thank you very can... much. Thank you very really much. Enjoyed it too. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thanks, Thanks Barry. Thanks, Vlad. Thank that was you. great. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Matthias. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.